Jack Smith, special counsel prosecuting Trump, responds to Trump's motion claiming presidential immunity. And we've read through Trump's filing saying, as the actual president, the leader, the commander in chief, you do in fact have additional powers that other people do not have, like the pardon power, where you get to tell people that you are exonerated from breaking the law. The president is literally above the law. The commander in chief power, the opinion clause power. There's all sorts of powers that are literally unique to the president. And one of Trump's arguments is saying that the actions that he has been indicted for were immune as a result of his presidency. Jack Smith has issued his response to this in a 54 page filing that we'll read through as we await Trump's reply. But this is what Jack Smith said. He says, defendant Donald Trump moves to dismiss the indictment, asking the court to afford him absolute immunity from criminal prosecution for what he claims was official conduct during his presidency. Now, they say this novel approach to immunity would contravene the fundamental principle that no man in this country is so high that he is above the law. They say Trump is not above the law. He is subject to the same criminal laws like more than 330 million other Americans, including members of Congress, judges, and everyday citizens. Now, none of the sources that he points to, including the Constitution's text and structure, history and tradition, or Supreme Court precedent supports the absolute immunity he asks the court to create for him, which I don't obviously think he's doing at all. I think that this thing exists. Exists. He's not asking the court to create it. That's Smith's, you know, interpretation. We'll get there. I'll hold off on commenting until we give it a little time. Now, in staking his claim, he purports to draw a parallel between his fraudulent efforts to overturn the results of the election that he lost. Conclusory statement there. Right? This is part of the argument. Argument is that the election was fraudulent and he was not breaking the law by enforcing the investigation of the fraud. Okay, he is the chief executive of the whole country. He has a duty to ensure that we have free and fair elections. And and if he does not investigate a fraudulent election, that is a dereliction of duty. So, right, they're just saying that he lost it. And we're saying that's debatable. In fact, a lot of evidence has come out to support the idea that it was, in fact, rigged in a million different ways, however you want to splice it. But they say the likes of the Gettysburg Address and the George Washington's Farewell Address. He says these things are not alike. The more apt parallel that he identifies is judges that he says are also enjoying absolute immunity from civil damages. But for the reasons set forth below, Trump's motion to dismiss based based on immunity should be denied. All right, let's see what else we got. They say a grand jury charged the defendant in a four count indictment. Now he says that he's quote, absolutely immune from prosecution. They say, your honor, you have to consider all of this as a whole if you want to dismiss. They say count one, which charges a conspiracy to defraud, alleges that Trump conspired to overturn the legitimate results of the 2020 election. The indictment also alleges that they tried to accomplish that in five ways. Deceit towards state officials, subverting the results, organizing fraudulent states of electors, sending those, leveraging the DOJ, enlisting the vice president, directing supporters to the Capitol to obstruct the proceeding, right? All that's in there. And exploiting the violence. Now counts two and three all incorporate these charges, blah, blah, blah. They say Trump's recognizes, but he fails to adhere to the legal standards here. Instead, he tries to reframe all of this. He says that communications with the Department of Justice and investigating a election crimes are all legitimate, which they are. Communications with state officials is legitimate, is Trump's arguments. Communications with the vice president, you're allowed to do that. Organizing alternative slates of electors is all okay. They say, but those characterizations are not consistent with the indictment. They're saying, okay, here are the five things that, you know, we're indicting Trump for doing these bad five things. Trump's saying, I'm allowed to do those five things. They're saying they're not consistent. Here's why. An individual who has served as the president of the United States, but is no longer in office may face investigation, indict and trial if convicted and punishment for conduct committed during the presidency. Now you'll notice here, there's no citation on that, which is like, what? Why is that not cited? Let's see. So like this is cited, right? No court has ever alluded to the existence of absolute criminal immunity for former presidents. Oh, is that true? Has any presidential candidate been indicted like this before? So it's never been an opportunity when he's running. Legal principles, historical evidence, and policy say that once out of office, a former president is subject to federal criminal prosecution like other citizens. Well, that might be true, but the conduct that Trump is alleged to have violated was committed while he was still the president. So these motions are just so ridiculous, okay? It's not even on point like other citizens. No court has ever alluded. They say he's out of office. Great, but he's being charged for January 6th, okay? Biden didn't come into power until 2021, January 21st, I think it was. No longer in office. You're charging him for conduct while he was in office. So all of this is basically irrelevant in my opinion. They say, indeed, 
indeed, a contrary rule would violate the fundamental principle that no one in this country, not even the president, is above the law, which is such a dumb statement. Like, literally, what is a pardon, okay? Somebody gets prosecuted by the law. They get indicted, convicted by a jury of their peers. Uh, the president with a magic wand says this, pardon, I'm above the law. Guess what? Now you are too. It's idiotic. Like, it's such a dumb statement. They keep repeating it. But the defendant's novel request for absolute immunity directly conflicts with the Constitution's impeachment clause, which expressly, this is so bad, which expressly contemplates the criminal prosecution of a former president for acts committed during and ultimately resulting in the president's removal from the presidency. Right. Yes, they're proving our point that Trump should have been indicted. He was. He was impeached. That was the indictment. And he was tried in the Senate and not convicted. And if you read the rest of that, in fact, we probably will. Let's see if they pull it up for us. If not, we'll pull it up. That says that after the conviction in the Senate, then you can indict them criminally. Okay. You go through the political trial first, then you can apply the civilian stuff. Now they say that provision ensures, among other things, that an officer who has been removed through impeachment removed. Trump was not removed ever. They tried twice, not ever. Cannot seek refuge in the principles of double jeopardy to remove, to avoid criminal prosecution. Okay. Trump has not been removed. So what is this like? If you're in law school, they're like, this is not even relevant. Why are you citing things that don't apply here? The defendant, however, would turn the impeachment judgment clause on its head and have the court read it as a sweeping grant of immunity that forbids criminal prosecution in the absence of a Senate conviction, which is right, which among other things would effectively preclude any form of accountability for a president who commits crimes at the end of his term. Not true. You could have impeached him for those crimes when he was out of office. Okay. The Senate had their trial when Trump was out of office, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's right. They had a whole proceeding. He wasn't even in office anymore. So it's ridiculous. It's not true. They could impeach him after the fact and they could at that moment declare he cannot run again. Now the defendant dismissed this very approach to the impeachment clause as nonsense and a complete canard during his impeachment trial which it is. And the court should do the same here. A president already enjoys two forms of immunity designed to afford protections to the discharge of his duties, but neither the temporary immunity from criminal liability that an incumbent president enjoys while in office, nor the absolute immunity that they currently enjoy from civil liability. Nixon was civilly liable for his actions in firing somebody suggest the existence of an unprecedented form of absolute immunity from criminal liability. To the contrary, they say the existence of both immunities is premised on the availability of criminal liability once a former president is out of office. Therefore, his motion to dismiss should be denied. Now, let's just take a quick look at... Well, let's come back to it. Let's see if they pull it up for us. Even if the defendant has satisfied his burden to establish that a former president could claim some novel immunity for acts committed during his presidency, denial of the motion is nonetheless warranted. Okay, wow. So they're even admitting that. Like, Your Honor, even if you think that he might have some presidential immunity, don't dismiss our case, which the judge will not, right? The motions to dismiss are very hard to get rid of. This is Judge Chutkin's courtroom, by the way. Recognizing immunity from federal criminal prosecution for a former president would pose substantial challenges regarding its scope and application, and Trump provides no suggestion for how to navigate that. At minimum, any such criminal immunity, consistent with Fitzgerald in the balancing of other cases, would be narrower than other things. Trump has not shown that the conduct alleged in this indictment within the boundaries of any understanding of immunity. So in other words, they're saying, you know, you have this immunity bubble for certain things. Some things we're very clear about. That's immune, that's not immune, right? If you're a doctor, for example, and you're operating on a patient who's not conscious, okay? There's some things that are within your bound that you're allowed to do. And if you do something outside of the bounds, right? Some things you'd be immune from because you're operating within the confines of your th- insurance will pay for that, insurance will pay, and you're not liable for those things. Here's an example, I'm not a doctor. But the same thing, right? If you do something outside of those bounds, right? You are clearly have broken the law, stuff like that. This is saying that Trump's immunity is not within that hula hoop. So dismissal is inappropriate because Trump cannot claim that every allegation in the indictment is protected by the president's official responsibility and therefore it would be immune. They give us some argument. They say, unlike the express immunity in the speech and debate clause, okay, Congress has immunity. No provision in the Constitution grants immunity to a sitting president. The Constitution provides the president removal, here we go, through impeachment and conviction of treasury, bribery, high crimes, and misdemeanors. That's the impeachment clause. Now, here's the second half of that. The 
impeachment clause further provides that although the sole punishment the Senate may impose is removal and disqualification, the impeached and convicted officer, okay, so once they go through the actual impeachment in the House, it goes over to the Senate for a trial. Trump was acquitted both times, but if he had been convicted, the convicted officer, quote, this is the Constitution, shall nevertheless be liable to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to the law. So once you have been convicted politically, then they can hit you criminally, would be the theory. So the Supreme Court has not addressed, not happened yet, a sitting or a former president's claim of immunity for criminal liability, but it has said so in civil. In the civil case, Nixon was being sued for a discrimination lawsuit. We'll fast forward through all of that. They said that Nixon was immune. Long story short. Now we fast forward through that. Now that was only civilly. They're going to distinguish that. But no legal principle supports the conclusion that Trump is immune for conduct undertaken during his presidency. They say they don't have supporting documents, Trump's people. And while some have disagreed with the longstanding view, listen to this. The truth is that presidential amenability to criminal prosecution, whether presidents can even be prosecuted at all, right? It's been the subject of extensive debate ever since the founding, which is strange because they keep telling us no one's above the law like it's a matter of fact, but that's not in fact true. And while some have disagreed with the DOJ's longstanding view that a sitting president may not be indicted, tried, convicted, or punished, there has been universal agreement that a former president may be subject to federal criminal prosecution, a principle recognized in the Constitution and rooted in historical practice. Again, citation please on that. Would like to see that, right? Now, this is missing a bunch. It's missing a citation, and it's also not giving us any authority to, here's the question, a former president may be subject to criminal prosecution for what? For activity in office? Like, you're missing all of that. Like, yes, if Trump leaves office and then goes and you know, embezzles a trillion dollars from somebody or whatever, you know, goes and hangs out with Hunter Biden and they, you know, go hit Malibu. Like, yeah, he could be indicted for that. Okay. If he walks out on Fifth Avenue and starts blasting people or something, you get the visuals. He could be indicted for that clearly. Obviously that's a crime, but he was in office when all of this was happening and the conduct happened in office, which means he's subject to the political trial process, not yours, but they're just missing everything. Like, and they're doing this intentionally. Okay. These are not stupid lawyers, probably. Moreover, the justifications that caused the Supreme Court to recognize absolute civil immunity does not require criminal immunity, you know, which is kind of asinine. It's like, if they thought that it was important for civil, why would it also not be important for criminal? Like people can sue you. That's a major liability for the presidency. It's the same thing. Prosecutors can just prosecute you. They say extending absolute immunity from civil to criminal would be inconsistent with logic. They say Trump says that his status as former president gives him absolute immunity. But if we accepted this, it would undermine this bedrock principle that no man in this country is so high that he is above the law. That's a U.S. Supreme Court case. Okay, so you see what they're citing? They're citing like it's meaningless. It's just irrelevant to the opinion. Now, I haven't read United States versus Lee, but I would guess that that is not really consequential to the outcome of the case. Does anybody in that case have a claim to be above the law? No. Is there a president in there? I don't know. Maybe there was. 1882. Was that Robert E. Lee? Maybe it's him. Okay. But was he the president of the United States? I don't know. It's inapplicable is my point, but they have extrapolated this and they apply it to Trump. The principle extends to all the officers of the government from the highest to the lowest. Is the president an officer? requiring every man who by accepting the office participates in its functions and they're strongly bound to that supremacy. And they say, and the principle that no one is above the law applies, of course, to a president. They have another case from Trump versus Vance. They're trying to bootstrap that opinion. And I don't know how that gets into immunity, but they say in choosing to break from the monarchy, they say the president, yeah, this is the point. The, Trump is not above all of the laws. He is subject to impeachment and removal. And upon removal, he can then be indicted, all for conduct within the presidency that he presided over. The principle that no one is above the law underlies the universal consensus that a president may be subject to criminal prosecution. Look at, they even admit it at some point. We concede that, by the way. That is point conceded. Got it. 
The United States has long taken the position that the Constitution affords a sitting president temporary immunity from criminal prosecution until the conclusion of his term, though some have disagreed with that. But Trump can identify no support that he's forever entitled to absolute immunity for any conduct while he served as president. This is so weak that it actually makes me think Trump's argument is that much stronger. Honestly, it feels like they're grasping at this. That a president may face criminal prosecution for conduct during a presidency when no longer in office draws support from the Constitution and historical practice. Like they're really stretching. They're having a hard time distinguishing Trump and his conduct was during the presidency. They have a real problem there. They can't separate it out. They say two constitutional provisions support the conclusion that a former president does not possess absolute immunity. They say we can infer that because the founders specifically gave it to the legislature so, and they didn't specifically give it to the executive. Therefore, we can infer that they didn't intend to. Now, we know the Constitution's silence on this is not dispositive. And in Fitzgerald, the Supreme Court case, civilly, they granted it. But the silence is telling when placed against the impeachment clause, right? So they admit because the other court found that even though it's silent, it doesn't say that, it doesn't mean that there's no immunity there. It clearly exists for civil. But that silence is telling when placed against impeachment, which expressly contemplates criminal prosecution. They even admit this following impeachment and conviction. It's wild. So where they admit, right, even in this motion that the Constitution expressly admits you can prosecute after impeachment and conviction. But where a president or any federal officer has been impeached by the House and convicted at an impeachment trial in the Senate, then the clause says that they shall nevertheless be liable according to the law. They say it would be incongruous to conclude that the Constitution shields a president where it says here that he may be subject to prosecution after impeachment and conviction. This is so dumb, it's unbelievable. So here's what they're saying. A president doesn't have blanket immunity. I mean, I understand what their argument is, right? They're saying he doesn't have blanket immunity. How do we know that? Well, because he can be convicted. Once he's convicted in the Senate, then we can prosecute him, which means that immunity doesn't exist generally, is what they're saying. It's a wild argument. It's terrible. But the immunity could be breached, right? Like the president might have that immunity. They find by the political process that he has been acting outside of the scope of the presidency. That is a violation of his political oath. He gets convicted. Then he no longer has that immunity because he's been convicted then you can prosecute him for the crimes. But that has never happened here. And they're just saying that because you could theoretically prosecute him after a Senate conviction, that somehow means there is no immunity in the first place. It just, you know, it's like, this is kind of basic stuff. It's like piercing the corporate veil, right? You've seen this in other areas of the law. Like you form a corporation, you're protected against liability from that corporation or an LLC until the LLC or somebody breaches the corporation, breaches the protection of that, and then you lose it. You have powers and then you lose them, okay? You have the pardon power when you're in office and then you lose it. You have the immunity until you're politically found to have violated that, then you don't. So they say it would be all the more strained to reach that conclusion in light of the impeachment system. Under the constitution, he's subject to impeachment. His argument that impeachment is the quote, exclusive method is incorrect. As noted, you can impeach and then criminally prosecute, which again, they admit, they understand that's the standard, but then they keep forgetting about that second half. You gotta have the conviction. They say if Trump's theory that a Criminal prosecution is only available when preceded by a, an impeachment and a conviction were correct. It would either completely shield a former president for criminal prosecution for crimes while committed in office, but discovered afterwards, which I don't agree with. I think they could impeach him after the fact, as they've done. Or it would require that Congress initiate impeachment proceedings against the former president. Exactly right. That's exactly right. It would require that, which is not a big deal. They can absolutely do that because they've already done it. It's not a big deal. But the impeachment clause does not empower Congress to control the core executive act of prosecution through the political impeachment process. All they have to do is just impeach him again. They already did that once. They say Trump's argument also flatly contradicts his claim during his second impeachment proceedings. And they talk about those arguments. They say separately his immunity claim in the fact of an acquittal as distinct from merely a conviction fares no better. And so they just keep going on. Look, a lot of citations here. We're going to fast forward through some of this. They say historical evidence from the time of the founding likewise confirms that a president was subject to prosecution when no longer in office. They say Alexander Hamilton wrote about this, said 
that an impeachment would not terminate the chastisement of the offender. He will still be liable to prosecution and punishment in the ordinary course of the law. Of course, no doubt, after an impeachment, after the trial and the removal, after the conviction, they're forgetting all of that. So we're gonna fast forward through that. Chief Marshall, they're going back through some legislative history. I really feel like they're grasping here. Here, yeah, right now they're getting some Texas Law Review articles. Oh man, they're scrambling. When we start going to Law Review articles, this is not good for them. They say in Fitzgerald, which was the case for absolute civil damages, the court considered immunity as functionally mandated incident of the president's office, right? That's exactly right. Civil immunity is just necessary because it has to be. It's mandated as incident. It's related to the unique office. It's supported by our history. And so obviously that should still apply in this case, in the criminal case. Now, actually they say that Fitzgerald doesn't apply here. Why? The five justice majority talked about the separation of powers rationale and that if you go through their concurrence and their various opinions on that, that they you know extrapolate some justification for it. All right, so in conclusion, for the foregoing reasons, the court should deny Trump's motion to dismiss the indictment on the ground that the former president is immune from criminal prosecution. All right, pretty short conclusion there. And we'll see what the judge does on this one now. Of course, Donald Trump will be issuing a reply to this the way that this always works is you have Trump filed the original motion to dismiss. Jack Smith files the response. Trump gets the final layer on the sandwich will be the reply and we'll see what he says. And that should be very good. We'll be looking forward to that. Overall impressions, not a great motion. I think that there is a lot more evidence here that Trump is immune and I cannot wait to see what his reply says. It felt like they were grasping. They had a very difficult time separating civil from criminal. They had a difficult time talking about in-office conduct versus out-of-office conduct. And they were citing law review articles and it's not very good. So we'll go through it, my friends. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for sharing this video with a friend or a family member for four our newsletter to a friend or family member. You can sign up for that at robertgovea.com and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one.